Apart from the football fiasco inquiry, seven other inquiries have been established over the last five years to deal with matters of grave public concern. But the records show that the public outcry which led to the establishment of these inquiries is gradually turning into a stony silence, all but forgotten and gathering dust in media archives. 24th March 1987, inquiry into alleged corruption at Mount Hope, Point Lisas and Iscot cost $200,000. Report pending. Chief Commissioner Alan Alexander. And it died a natural debt. Nothing occurred. 8th May 1987. Inquiry into constitutional reform. Duration three years. Chief Commissioner Sir Isaac Hayat Ali. It was presented and up to today that report has not been debated in Parliament and government has not taken any decision, either the last government or this government, in respect of the particular matter. So it was a colossal waste of time, a waste of energy, and in effect a waste of taxpayers' money. 3rd June 1988, inquiry into an explosion at Camp Omega in which six men died. Report pending. Chief Commissioner Justice Alcalde Warner. Still going ahead. There's no end to it, and one doesn't know when it's going to finish. If it is that, that, um, that the commissions are taking an eternity to report and so on. And that is not a condemnation of the decision to appoint an inquiry. It may be a condemnation of the persons involved in, in, in conducting the inquiry. 28th July 1989, inquiry into the presumed death of PC Salvary and operations of the police and defense force at La Tinta Bay. Duration, three years. Cost, half a million dollars. Chief Commissioner Frank Solomon. Well, when one reads the act, one gets the impression that commissioners really ought not to charge fees for the work that they do. But my information is that no, no charges have been laid, and I'm, I'm quite surprised. I'm quite surprised because the report of the commission, um, in, as we, from what I remember having read the report, the report was quite clear that, uh, the, you know, the, that in the view of the commissioners, um, crimes had been committed. 17th March 1989, inquiry into the retention of the death penalty. Report submitted, Chief Commissioner Elton Prescott. The commission recommends that the death penalty be proceeded with, or be, 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 be retained, and then the government sits on it. Well, I mean, that is an indictment against the government, and that's an indictment, an indictment against the, the present government. Whether um, the death penalty should apply to certain offenses, whether there should be degrees of murder, these things have important impact on the social life of the country. No decision has been taken. 16th April 1992, inquiry into allegations of a drug cartel in the police service. Report submitted. Chief Commissioner Justice Alcalde Warner, not debated or publicized. 26 June 1992, inquiry into 13 deaths at St. Anne's Hospital. Report pending. Chief Commissioner Sir Isaac Hayatari. The government is using the public inquiry machinery as a vehicle for diverting public opinion away from the issue which was involved at the time, which in effect is taking away the role of an inquiry as an instrument of government to an instrument of suppression. Well, I am sure that that's what governments have done in the past. I don't know that, um, uh, that the NAR government did that when we appointed commissions. Um, the purpose was to get at the, the bottom of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem that faced the country at the time. I think the public perception of commissions of inquiry is that they serve no useful purpose. That is unfortunate, but understandable. But attorneys say commissions are necessary and recommend precept witnesses to shorten inquiries place time limits on commissions to complete reports, ensure that commissioners are not paid in accordance with the Act, conduct mandatory parliamentary debates on reports. Murad says that if you, the public, don't keep up the pressure to ensure that commissions' reports are speedily completed and implemented, the ills of society will go on unchecked. Ira Marthal, TV6 News, with a special report. Inquiries without answers.
it would display the name of the premises and its address along with the type of signature that is up for a burglary. You tend to put in the rotan and, and that's your security. You know, your gates and your rotan windows, um, something for the door. And then you find eventually from experience that, you know, the, the, because of the sophistication of some of the burglars, that that really doesn't offer you the protection. So you go to the next stage, which is the electron, you put, put an electronic alarm system. You are being rubbed in movie style scenarios. So people know that no one is safe, not even the president, not even the poor man. That is the feeling that we have in this country. None shall escape. And that is what makes the fear a very heavy burden on every citizen. Because they walk around just thinking, will it be me next? Police statistics show that robberies and break-ins are among the crimes now on the rise giving way to fear and the people living in jail. The public is gripped by this rampant existence of fear and their only reaction on a personal basis is to fortify themselves at home. So what you have really these days are not homes in the traditional sense with an open porch, a window for breeze to come in. You have garrisons, you have fortresses Widespread fear means business for some 200 security and related firms around the country. Services ranged from armed guards, sophisticated alarms, automatic gates and dogs. Ironically, the price tag of up to $30,000. When the glass is vibrated at a certain frequency, it triggers the glass break. And I, um, I decided on it because we have this, I don't know the span of this, this must be 12 feet of open window which I specifically wanted because I wanted to retain that tropical openness, that indoor-outdoor feeling. Burglar proofing is no longer an option. The days gone by where you know, it was more um, restricted to areas. Now it is anywhere you want, to, anywhere you're building a home, whether it be the low-class, middle-income or upper-income bracket, right? burglar proofing is in fact necessary. Five years ago, I think one could have right, still left right, their, their back doors with, with, with an ordinary wooden door. right? Um, no, now it's no longer like that. Every area is susceptible. Everybody in the area is kind of unsafe for themselves, right? Because some need work, this one crying out for this, some crying out for that, right? And then now everybody ain't happy. And it goes for a lot of people around too. Eh? Police say they're doing all they possibly can to tackle crime. Given the constraint within which we have to operate, we could hardly be expected to do more. Some of them do not ever report, so that you have one of these intransigents going free. When in truth and in fact with their support, we would have been able to curtail some offenses by quite a few, if only they would report. And security firms fill the gap. If you had the sort of police service that people felt confident that, you know, that they would get the response and and, and they uh, felt that you know the, the, the majority of break-ins, the, the would-be attackers are, are apprehended, and there was a considered effort to get to the bottom of crime. I, I think that has been one of the major problems, that without that confidence, our people have to look out for themselves. It's not just a question of police and thief, says one psychologist, but social problems, poverty, unemployment, and the judicial system form the roots of crime. The amount of people who find themselves in jail as against those who are accused and charged is a very small proportion. The courts sit at the center of the problem. What's the solution to crime? I wouldn't answer that. I think, frankly, I will tell the country, ask your government. I have been in parliament. I have looked at ministers in their faces and told them what to do. And they have played one time after another politics with the issue and playing politics with people's lives and safety. The ball has been thrown into the court of the politicians. But until such a time comes when citizens feel safe in their own homes without having to barricade it up, this is the only answer. Ira Mathur, TV6 News, with a special report.
Galaxy and this talk about it, I know for 100 percent sure that it is fraud or Tree Top. I've seen it took place. When Tree Top called in the fraud squad last month, it was to investigate suspected fraud running into millions of dollars. Official sources say up to $9 million was embezzled from the purchasing department. The OWTU says the figure stands at over $40 million. Whatever the true figure, this Trintock worker claims to have full knowledge of the fraud. A junior employee at Trintock, Mr. X, emerges as the chief protagonist. He's the kingpin behind it, but he's not the only person involved in the fraud. The other companies, the other companies, uh, the, uh, there's two major oil companies that supply Trin Tobacco, they also have been involved in the fraud. Here's what he says happened. Orders for thousands of dollars were made out in forms. The white copy went to the suppliers, the pink to invoicing, and the blue and the yellow to the warehouse. The guy in concern, Mr. X, he's to sign the bill as receiving at the warehouse. But actually no goods came to Trin Tobacco. There was just a signature, and then it was taken over to the payment department, where it was matched up with the company's pink copy, which the guys forged the signature of the managers, and they were paid on that. That's just to show that there's a, a flaw in the system, a trim top, because if an ordinary material assistant, I should say, could do such thing, then anybody could defraud the company. And this has been going on for the past three, four years. We are treating the matter as one of our priority fraud investigations at this point in time. And we are hopeful that the investigations will be swift and thorough because we are very concerned about the matter. We find that it is being treated um, a bit too quietly, you know. By now, um, some people um, should some people should be um, identified. You have to come real to the charge, Mr. X, because Mr. X, as I say, is just a receiving clerk. All he does is sign for receiving items. He signs a bill. That is all he does. So they have no serious evidence against Mr. X, except his signature as signing, and that, that's his job. He's doing his job. All hopes of bringing the Trintox scam out into the open rest here with the fraud squad. Trintox sources say investigators will need to have a detailed and minute knowledge of the workings of the purchasing department to get anywhere. Meanwhile, the fraud squad is predictably mum on when they expect to reveal the findings of the fraud squad on the Trintox issue. Our own view is that big people are involved in this thing. More on that tomorrow night. Ira Marthu, TV6 News, with a special report. In last night's special report, one Trintock employee with alleged inside knowledge of the fraud revealed just how millions of dollars were embezzled from the company Trintock. The question now is, how did such a major fraud scam go undetected by the company for some three to four years before the fraud squad were brought in? But the company, my senior management level, should investigate the managers at the materials department, at the purchasing department. Because, for instance, if I am a manager, and over for the past three years, I don't know that there have been fraud or there's this ordinary mistakes, defrauding my department over 15 million dollars worth of goods or in money then i shouldn't be there as a manager another probing statement which implicates managers comes from the owtu i do not accept at all that we uh, with an absence of systems to detect and to to stop what 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 is taking place my advice to the management is that they must begin to do their jobs. This worker says goods are disappearing from Trintock's material department, which holds an estimated $200 million worth of stock. The people at the refinery, up at the refinery, or different plants would come down and say, this is a rush job and we need so and so and so. That they don't have any documents saying that they want that. But because of their ranks or their position, they just go it up into a vehicle and they go, these, these goods probably taken from the warehouse 
goes back to a supplier, an oilfield supplier, and then the supply back to Trinta. What proof do you have of this? Well, there is proof. There is proof. Everybody knows proof, but uh, I see. I see. I personally see what has been going on. There are claims of other discrepancies. Our company has been ordering bed mattresses, microwave oven, fridges. I don't know why you could swear like for a house. These kind of things we really, I want to know what's going on. We don't really order these things. And you see it coming in. A team of investigators, whoever they would be, I don't know, should thoroughly investigate the operations of that company. As a matter of fact, I go so far as to say that all of these companies should now be subject, because of what has been happening, should now be subject to some kind of parliamentary scrutiny. One more question. Why did Trintock employees stay silent in the matter if they knew about it? No more of employees had an idea. But he just wasn't seeing anything because Mr. X was just like them. He was a small fry, I should say, just like them. And he was being ridiculed and frustrated. And everybody shared in the world. Including you? Well, I refuse to comment on that. Ira Mathur with the TV6 special report on fraud at Trentock. The first man was shot in his tie and because he continued uh, violence against me, I had I shot him in his chest, but he being under the influence of coke, they just kept coming, it didn't slow them down. Uh, the other person was shot in his head after being shot also in his chest who just kept coming. The only thing that slowed him down was a shot to his head. Unfortunately, he passed away quietly. This businessman is licensed to kill to protect his family and property. This is what the average man in the street carries now, a revolver or semi-automatic. In 1991, some 1,500 gun licenses were granted. So far this year, the figure has doubled. By the end of the year, there will be more than 4,500 new licensed gun holders. You load six rounds, and you're ready to fire. A few, like this woman, are trained, but all are determined to shoot if they have to. Three men broke into the home. My husband, my father-in-law, they were there, you know, and um, they were just cutting away at my, my family. What do I do? I could not have done anything to assist them in any way. We applied for a permit, which was granted to us, and uh, we, we are making full use of it. And certainly something like this will not happen again. Unlike some states in America, our citizens can't walk into a gun shop with a driver's license and buy a gun. Although the police commissioner decides whether you deserve one, you don't have to be trained to get a license. The records show that very often these firearms issued turn back to haunt them that they become victims of their own attempt to protect themselves. No one knows just how many illegal arms are out there. Whatever the number, it's one too many. Last year alone, there were some 300 armed crimes. This year, the figure stands at 150 so far. All in all, a potentially controversial and explosive situation. The guns will just bring on the criminal. Will bring on criminal guns, and the and the criminals will outgun anybody. You know, if you have a gun, the criminal's going to get a better one, and it's just going to escalate like that. You're 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 going to move straight back into the position you were before, of being threatened by the criminal. They're going to get more sophisticated weapons, no matter what you do. Look at the amount they had in July. After you re you reach a situation whereby the businessmen and certain members of the public have to have weapons, have them trained properly, and arm them. To shoot to stay alive, if somebody shoots at me, I'm gonna shoot back. That sounds stupid, because if somebody shoots at you and they're accurate, then you don't live to shoot back. So that we don't only deal with shoot, we deal with a don't shoot situation, an alertness situation, um, 
uh, a situation that makes the defense gun owner aware of his or her surroundings. This um, sort of viciousness and power creeping into society. I think it's, it, it's all quite wrong. It, you know, it's going opposite to, to what the religions and the, and, and, and the people and the, think that the, the thoughtful people are trying to move society the other way, and this is obviously going to push it the wrong way. If you are armed and the man is coming at you with a knife and you tell him to drop that knife and he fails to do it, he's going to be shot. You did not have a weapon. And he came with that, he's going to kill you. One, one can't, mustn't um, be judge and jury with a gun in your hand. The bottom line is that a gun in untrained hands brings power without responsibility, which can only lead to loss of human life. Ira Mathur, TV6 News, with a special report on citizens up in arms. A thriving drug trade has led to a thriving arms trade. Increasing drug-related deaths bear testimony to this. These are some of the hundreds of guns which illegally entered the country last year. How? There are several ways. They could have been shipped in from Miami, tucked inside plywood, and somehow passed customs at a port, like the Jamaat arms. In rare instances, some come through customs at Piaco. Cedrus is a notorious area of entry for smugglers. But these arms could have simply slipped in at almost any point at our 300 mile long coastline. In caves like the ones you just saw, it is easy to hide anything from arms to drugs. And there are thousands of similar caves right across the coastline of Trinidad and Tobago. Chief of the Defence Staff, Brigadier Brown, who would not go on camera, says the Coast Guard is not equipped to fight the drugs and arms trade. It has one aircraft, 19 years old, with no night sighting capability, a paltry three fast patrol boats, and 11 patrol launches. I mean, those things cost a lot of money, and it depends on the availability of funds to deal with these things. I, so I don't, I can't tell you that I'm going to get 10 other vessels when we don't have money to buy two. Brown says the threat is real, particularly since he says the Jamaat's contacts in Miami and possibly the customs are intact. Not so, says the minister. But I am not going to go running all over the place as though I have shadows behind me threatening to, to, to kill and burn down the country. I, I, I am not going to put any extra sort of security measures in place. As I have said before, they, they, are, they are outside, and if there are any infractions of the law, they will, they will be dealt with, with as any other citizen. What's to be done, the National Security Minister says, with assistance from America and France, the government will be able to crack the drug and arms trade soon, starting with customs. We have a big problem at customs, and. Uh, it is something that the government has, has reiterated over and over that we are dealing with that situation. And uh, I mean, it is one of the most uh, crucial areas in this country that is the ports and the whole customs function. Arresting so-called drug lords. Very soon we will, we will probably have the type of information and evidence that we require before you, we, in order to arrest those so-called drug lords, as you put it. One must understand that you do not just accept rumor that X or Y are drug lords and you just go out there and arrest them. You need proper evidence to, to have convictions. The fact is, there are still a large number of arms out there. In the early 70s, the infamous flying squad fought armed guerrillas. Time, the solution could lie in an amnesty. If it is that it is not possible to find the arms through the normal security measures, then one may very well have to consider some amnesty program to get these people to bring in their arms. 
The chief of defense says it's time citizens do their duty, tip off the security forces when they can. In the meantime, we live behind bars, are sometimes armed, and perhaps not a little paranoid. Ira Mathur, TV6 News, with a special report, Up in Arms. This country's collective exuberance and then collective grief after that fateful football match on November 19, 1989 quickly turned into outrage. But how many of you still remember your concerns over an overcrowded stadium? It was you, the taxpayer, who requested the commission of inquiry, and you, the taxpayer, who are still paying for it. The Football Commission of Inquiry began in March 1990 to investigate the apparent overcrowding of the National Stadium during a World Cup qualifying match, including security, safety breaches and the number of tickets printed by the TTFA. 43 meetings, 42 witnesses and two and a half years later, there seems to be no end in sight to it. I feel personally and I think people must begin to feel this. Investigation must be expensive, notwithstanding Mr. Simongal's protestations, but I feel it must be expensive and it needs to be brought to a conclusion. What we need to ascertain is why, why is it that commissions of inquiry appear to take so long to submit their reports? And a good example of that, which is current, is the football inquiry, which seems from the public's point of view to be going on uh, Ad infinitum. Although the Attorney General would not comment, TV6 understands that this inquiry could be costing the state up to half a million dollars so far. So why the delay? Commissioner Lionel Semangal, who would not go on camera, calls it one of the most dynamic and complicated inquiries ever held here, and one with many blocks, the biggest of which is that the TTFA took two years to submit its audited accounts, still uncertified by the accountant. This means that this audit was not certified. Nevertheless, the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association at its annual general meeting approved this uncertified audit by a vote of 16 to 13. That was deemed inadequate. A team of government auditors were appointed, who in turn recommended a full-time auditor to the inquiry. O'Connor admits the accounts were late, but... Is it a slow on the... On, 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 on the, the the people who have done the audits, I don't know, but I have never heard of an auditor having his audit audited. What you can ask is somebody else to conduct a full audit of, of, of the proceedings. The investigation doesn't hinge on the accounts of the TNTFA, so don't let people tell you that that is the whole thing. The investigation hinged upon the, the overall, how people got in, what were the security arrangements, at what time were the gates opened. Um, many, many things. It, 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 the, the accounts were just part to see if the monies collected at the game related could have been properly accounted for. O'Connor has problems with the manner in which the inquiry is being conducted. Well, several people, including one person who wrote to the media, complained about some of the unusual outbursts that one hears. On the on on the uh, and, and opinions cast aspersions cast by the commissioner against people who are still to appear. Meanwhile, the three key witnesses, Peter O'Connor, Brigadier Brown, and Jack Warner, are yet to be called up. It is very difficult for him to fix a date when he would restart the hearings. This will depend heavily, of course, on the findings of the auditor. And having done that. Each witness will be given adequate opportunity to be represented by counsel, and uh, those sittings will take quite some time. When the report is submitted, and there is no pressure from the public because they're not concerned, the very person to whom the report is submitted feels no special uh, need to pursue it because it is no longer topical or no longer controversial. 
it's rather strange. As I said, I, I can't account for that. And um, perhaps it's linked to the whole question of a review of the, ju the whole judicial system in the country. And if the public has to wait ad infinitum for the report, legal sources say that it will serve only as an...